Welcome to our brand new series called Difficult People. Now we all know some. Uh, some of us work with some. Some of us live with some. And some of us are some. So it's going to be an interesting series. As we, as we said last week, we put it out there. We wanted to get someone to help with the graphics. And so uh, Nathan Brown came up with this little gem for difficult people. But that one, I'll go back to the other one first. This was the gem that actually made it. This is the one that made it into the cut. Now we're going to look at the ones that didn't make it into the cut. Let's flick back one. And you'll notice this little gem of difficult people. And if you look through all this here, if you come in really close, you'll see that's me right there. He's put me in there, so that one didn't make it into the cut. But when things would, couldn't get any worse, they actually did get a bit worse because this is his other one. And this is the one where I'm actually in every box as a difficult person. So there you go. So they didn't make the cut, so we're going with the emoji one. He's done a great, great job. I think that happened because last week, uh, Pastor Anita, who's lived with us since she was about 17, um, insinuated that perhaps I might be a little difficult. So I just think, why not? Let's get it out there. Why don't you just jump in the chat right now? Pastor Kev, is he difficult? Yes or no? No one's going to follow up and you won't get kicked out of the church. You might go to hell, but that's your problem. But anyway, just go check on there. Yes or no, is Pastor Kev difficult? We're going to find out about that. And while you're, doing, while you're just going through that, I just want to say to you right up front, yes, I can be difficult at times. Let me get it right out there. If someone pushes the right buttons, I can be difficult. But here's the deal. So can you. We can all be difficult. We all grew up in families of origin where things were not the way they should be and we got a certain element of brokenness and we get hurt and we get damaged and we have this hypersensitivity to things that just someone can push those buttons and we can just go off. And we're all in a, in a process of trying to get back to God's original design. But if someone pushes the right buttons, you can become difficult, I can become difficult. Now, if you grew up in a very chaotic family, very chaotic, you could be even more difficult and more difficult to everyone. That's what we want to talk about. You know, uh, I don't think, I'll be interested to see what the stats say at the end about whether I'm difficult or not. I don't think I'm so difficult on the relational side, but I'm very difficult when it comes to uh, if someone tries to undermine the message or what the mission of what God wants us to do, then I can be difficult because I know I can't move away from that. But here's another question for you to jump in the chat about. What about Jesus? And was he difficult or not difficult? Yes or no? Jesus difficult, not difficult. What do, you, what do you reckon? And while you're thinking about that, I'll just toss a few things out. I mean, what about when he pulled this little party trick? He goes into the temple and they're all buying and selling. They're doing all sorts of stuff. And so he goes away and he makes a whip of cords. He comes back in, gets the whip, drives everyone out, throws over the tables. And he messes the whole place up. And then he says, my father's house should be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. Man, that's just difficult. Man, the temple was a very profitable enterprise in their days. And he's just difficult. And what about when he tossed out this gem? What about this gem? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Unfollow. That's what happened. A whole bunch decided to unfollow. That was just way too difficult. What about when he walks up and he goes, you know, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Now, we listen to that in our 21st century. Ah, oh, no big deal. You know what they heard in that? They heard Jesus walking out, pulling out two six shooters and going, I got two guns, one for each of you, and he's shooting all of the pagan gods because he's saying there's only one way. He said there's only one way. That's just difficult. And he's always breaking the Sabbath. I mean, what, what, what's with the Sabbath? Why have you got to do that all the time? And, and then he says, well, you know, I know you like Moses and I know you like the temple, but you know what? Someone and something greater than Moses in the temple is here. And by the way, it's me. It's just difficult. It's difficult. So sometimes difficult messages come that make life difficult as well. Now, what I'm going to share now is going to mess with all the people that like grammar. So if you're an English teacher and you like grammar, I just want to apologize because you're not going to like this. But the point is for you to not like it. It's for you to remember it. So here it is. Difficult is as difficult does. When you do difficult things, because difficult you is. You is difficult, and we need to figure out why is you difficult. So that's going to be the journey that we're on. But sometimes God will give us difficult messages. 
in order to change us, to shape us, to grow us, to lead us, to conform us to the image of Christ, to adjust us where things, to adjust us in areas where we're not thinking straight, we're a bit out of shape. And, I, uh, and so I want you to know that this whole concept of difficult is so big because not everybody that's difficult is of the devil. Now, I just want you to know that they're not all of the devil. Sometimes, now, some of them are, and let's just read this portion of Scripture from Matthew because this is where we get to see, once again, another difficult difficult portion of scripture for those of us that maybe have certain theological positions, particularly around end times. Jesus is talking around the kingdom. He says, the field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. Keep going. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. So he, he says right up front, Matthew, inspired writing, historical context is saying, there are some that are difficult and they're planted there by the devil. They're there. So you've got to know that they're there. But he also says this kingdom, this kingdom, it, it's going to have good people, good kingdom people, and difficult people sowed in by the evil ones. So let's, go, let's read on. It says, the harvest is the end of the age. So this is talking about the return of Christ. This is the end of the age. And the harvest is of the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. So this is the sorting that's going out. Keep going. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. So this is very interesting. So the kingdom is going to have both good and evil in context in this mixture when the angels come with Jesus at the return to actually wind things up. Keep going. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if you, that's never good. If, if you hear that for you, that's not good. Keep going. The righteous will then shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. That's a really difficult portion of scripture because it tells us there are certain difficult people that are actually planted in around the kingdom by the enemy in order to distract you away from God's best for you. But the other difficult part from that, if you grew up like I grew up with dispensational theology about the end times, it's, it's challenging because it says when Jesus returns and the angels, the good people and the evil ones are there together and the angels are doing the sorting, which kind of messes with things. So some people are difficult because they're evil. Most people are difficult because they are broken. They're broken. So difficult is as difficult does. When you do difficult things, it's because difficult you is. But the question is, is you evil or is you broken? I don't know about you, but I think life's difficult enough. And you're like, I like what Jesus had to say. Wherever possible, live at peace with all people, wherever possible. Let's just live at peace. You know, it's so difficult. The season that we're in, man, you've got COVID restrictions, you've got social distancing, erasing of statues and injustices and, and doomsday preppers and the end of the world. They're all coming out. And, and so people are so wound up about this because they've been isolated that it's like every time you, you can, someone, you can see them coming, you can see a big EGR on their head. And you know this is going to mean extra grace required. And they're there because they're worked up. Like, I remember first experiencing this long before I was a Christian. I was a bricklayer with my dad, and we had this lady, and she, she, we, every day she'd come onto the job site, and every day she'd change her mind. And dad said to her one day, he said, he said, honey, he said, I don't know why you're being so difficult. Just a little bit more effort, and you could be impossible. It, it didn't go well. But he was expressing that. Why are you being so difficult? Changing for the sake of changing. Because things are difficult enough. And that's the situation that we're living in. But you can be difficult. I can be difficult. Someone push the right buttons and you go from divine to difficult in a heartbeat. That's just the way it is. I'm sure you've had some time in your life where you have suddenly erupted and you don't know why have I even, why am I reacting like this? What is going on here? It's because somebody has pushed on the button of some area of brokenness within you. When that happens, we all got to give each other extra grace. We have to have extra grace required, but we've also got to love each other to say, you probably want to look at what's going on there. We call that emotionally healthy spirituality, EHS. We say, you need to EHS that. Why are you behaving the way that you're behaving? It's something from the well of your life, something that you've learnt a behavior that is not helpful to you, and you got to help people to then get healthy. So, what are we learning? There are difficult people everywhere because we're everywhere. But over this series, we're going to look at three particular traits of difficult people that are very, very challenging. 
Next week, we're going to look at the critical people. They're the ones that it doesn't matter what you do. There's no pleasing them. They're just going to, it doesn't matter. You just can't please them. And then the week after that, we're going to look at the emotional vampires, those that drain the living daylights out of you. What do you do with them? But for the rest of this morning, I want to talk about something that I'm pretty sensitive about, and that's manipulation, manipulative people. And we're going to look at some of the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew part of the Bible for the nation of Israel, and we're going to look at some of the Christian scriptures for all the other nations, which is us. What I love about this book is it's a library of books, two major covenants, and God never sanitizes it. For whatever reason, church leaders feel like we have to sanitize what happened in the Old Covenant. You don't have to. It is what it is. It was what it was. It was bad. Just leave it alone. It's nothing to do with us. But there's a lot to be learned in there. And you see manipulation turning up in Genesis chapter 25. And Jacob and Esau is a really, really good example. Esau, is, it says Esau's a skilled hunter. He's gone out and he's been hunting. He's been out several days. He's come back famished. He, he feels like he's about to die. He's, he's, he's right at the very end. Now, that immediately tells me he's not that good a hunter if he couldn't actually catch anything. But anyway, he's come back and his brother is whipping up a red lentil stew. And he says to his brother Jacob, oh man, give me some food, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And Jacob manipulates the situation and says, well, if you want the food, you're the firstborn son. You sell me your birthright so that I get all the blessing of the firstborn because the firstborn's got everything. And so Esau just sells it out for a red lentil stew. I would rather die than eat a red lentil stew. But he sells out. He gets manipulated. And Jacob does this. And it's all in there in all its glory. And he doesn't stop there. He steals his blessing a bit later on, a few chapters later. So there's manipulation. You see it in Mark chapter 6 with Herod. And he's, uh, he's married his uh, brother's wife, Herodias. Now, I just, I just think that's his brother's wife, Philip. Sorry, his brother's wife, Herodias, which is Philip's wife. Now, why you'd want to marry your brother's wife if it wasn't working out for him, I don't know. Once again, doesn't hide it. The Bible doesn't hide this. So he marries his brother's wife. John says, this is not good. You can't do that. So he puts John in prison, and he's kind of a bit scared of John because he's the man of God. And um, anyway, he puts on this big banquet, and he's got all these people coming in, and there's drinking, and there's wine, and they're having fun, and it's all exciting. And then Herodias' daughter comes and dances for him. And she dances, and she's such a fantastic dancer. And he's drunk way too much. And he starts shooting his mouth off and says, whatever you want, I'll give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. So she scoots back to mom and says, mom, what do you want? And she goes, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. How'd you like that for winning a dance comp? Head of John the Baptist. Maybe that's why everybody wants to get ahead in life. I don't know. But she wants the head of John the Baptist. So she comes back to him, and Herod is devastated because he now has to follow through, and he's been manipulated. He's been manipulated. And then, of course, another big famous one is in Judges chapter 16, where that's the story of Samson, who was one of the strongest men that ever lived. He was so, so strong. And they couldn't, the Philistines couldn't figure out how to get, where is this supernatural strength coming from? Anyway, he takes up with this girl called Delilah, and she wants to know what's going on. And she tries to badger him, and she says, he tells her all sorts of things about what it is, and he won't actually tell her. But in the end, look at what happens. In this verse here, he says, in the end, she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. Some versions say, uh, what are they? there's a version that says, um, can't stand it any longer, vexed his soul unto death. It's like, she just nagged him, and she just nagged him, and she manipulated him, and she kept going after him. She kept, and eventually, he wore down, and he told her what would take place. He said, it's in my hair. If a hair is cut off, I lose my strength. And so that's exactly what she orchestrates. He loses his hair, devastation, not a good story. But manipulation is in everywhere. The Bible doesn't hide it. It's there. We have to watch it. So let's get practical. There's two main, two main weapons that people use that are manipulating these difficult people. First is threats. If you want to work here, you'll do this. Uh, if you don't do this, I'm leaving you. If you don't tell me, I'm hanging up. Or what about this? If you don't pay me more attention, I'll find someone that will. If you know what I mean. If you don't do this, you don't get any of that. It's threats. That's their first line of their 
thing, the manipulators. And the second is when that doesn't work, then you go to guilt. If you love me, you'll do what I ask. After all I've done for you, and you won't do one thing for me. Or the silent trip. I'm sorry, I can't talk to you right now. Talk to the hand. Or what about this one? I thought we were close. I thought we were friends. I thought I could count on you. Obviously, I can't. You, you don't do this, man. You're not, you can't even call yourself a Christian. If you don't fight, meet my needs, well, I guess I'll have to look elsewhere. See, the two points that they use, manipulators use, are threats, and then they use guilt. Now, most times we do this because we've learned ugly things from our families of origin growing up and the way that we behave and the way that we work. But some are actually evil. Some are there to distract you away from what God is trying to do. So you are going to figure out which one they are. Now, what I, would re I really wished you were all here now because I'd just say, let's have a show of hands uh, right now if you go, somebody is trying to manipulate you. And I think that would have been just awesome. But think about it. Is there someone in your world that's trying to manipulate you? I do want to make a statement about manipulation because it's, it's one of those words that I can't say what's happened to it, but it's been severely damaged. Not all manipulation is bad. God is sovereign. He's sovereign over everything. He's got a sovereign work that's going on. He's had to deal with the mess that humanity made. He's dealt with the mess that's taking place, um, that the devil is doing out there through his evil ones. But he's continually manipulating behind the scenes to get us to the correct place. And oftentimes, he's even working behind the scenes of our lives, manipulating us to protect us from ourselves at different times. So not all times in this world is it, it, is it wrong. Like, I go to the chiropractor every week. I got a great chiropractor, and he, my back just gets in real mess. It gets bent out of shape, and I can't function. And he goes in, and he adjusts, and he says, I'm going to manipulate your spine to make things straight. And once he puts it straight, that's great. So not all manipulation is bad. But in the context of relationships of people trying to control each other, it's always bad. Always bad. So remember, difficult is, as difficult does, when you do difficult things, it means that difficult you is. But is you evil or is you broken? So here's what you got to do with manipulation. We've got to recognize when someone is trying to control you. There's a great portion of scripture on this we'll read where it's Jesus is talking to Peter. It says, Jesus began to explain to his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Watch this. Peter took him aside. This is a classic thing of people that are manipulating. They won't go into small groups. They won't be involved in villages. They lose their power there. Peter begins to take him aside. It's a one-on-one -on -one control thing. And he begins to rebuke him. This is never going to go good when you're taking aside the Son of God and rebuking him on what's going on. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Now, what's going on there? Is Peter, is Peter evil? Is he evil? Or is he concerned? What is actually going on? The real thing is that God has a plan for Jesus, but so does Peter have a plan for Jesus. And so Peter is trying to manipulate Jesus to fulfill what's on his mind. And Pete's plan goes something like this. We got a great band together here, Jesus. We got some really neat stuff going on. I think we should take this on tour. I've got caps and t-shirts coming. So we're going to start soon. And you going away is going to interfere with my plan. But there is another plan being orchestrated in the back that Peter doesn't know about. So you've got to be careful. When it comes, you've got to be able to recognize manipulation when people want to pull you aside and want to just instruct you for themselves. So here are, here are four things that will help you know if you're being manipulated. And I tried these on my uh, staff to see how it went. You can't say no to a certain person. You just can't say no. I tried it. I tried to give you the staff to get to do things that I wanted them to do, which I knew they didn't want to do. They all said no. So that's good for them, and I still don't get the stuff done. So, but you can't say no if you're being manipulated by someone. You always feel guilty. They always want to pull you aside exclusive, and they always got this kind of like um, unhealthy loyalty. And this starts very young. Uh, Dexter came home. Dexter's a little 
six-year-old, and um, is he six? I don't know what he is, six, somewhere in there. Anyway, he comes home from kindy, and he's got it happening at kindy. Oh, well, I've got to be this one's best friend, and if you're going to be my best friend, you can't be someone else's best friend because you're my best friend, and please don't talk to that one because that's their best friend, but you're going to be my, you're my best friend, aren't you, Dexter? And it was winding him up. It was really upsetting him. So I don't know. I, maybe it was one of those words from God. I said, Dexter, I want you to repeat this after me. I am Dexter Cruz Rosso, and he repeats it, and I said, and I am everybody's best friend. I said, that's what I want you to memorize. And he started using that, and the whole thing shifted, and then I taught it to Indy. People that want to manipulate you want to pull you away and make you feel guilty about things if you go somewhere else. So you've got to watch this. You also, ultimately, you feel responsible. You feel this fear of letting people down if someone is trying to manipulate you, and you will compromise your values. Sometimes you'll do things that you know you should never do, but you will because you feel like you cannot say no. So what you need once you recognize this is just follow Jesus' model of 100% grace because you've got to offer grace, extra grace required, but then 100% truth, which means that you've got to do something about this, and it's probably not going to be very comfortable to start with. So you recognize that this is what's going on. I am being manipulated. Then you just say these words. This is not going to work on me. This is not going to work on me. And then you could follow Jesus' approach if you want to. Let's read that. This is what Jesus did with Peter. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, I, I would just err on caution here. While you're still trying to figure out whether this one is difficult because this one is evil or whether this one is broken, I would maybe drop the Satan part out at the moment, just leave it, because it's hard to get back from that once you've called someone Satan. But he says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So Pete's got this highly humanitarian thing rising up that's violating what God is actually calling him to do. So you've got to be able to say to the person, this is not going to work on me. I'm sorry, it's not going to work. That's challenging, but you've got to be able to step. That's the 100% truth along the 100% grace. And the reason you've got to do that is because every adult, I'm not talking about kids, kids need some control, but once you're an adult, you must make sure that no human being is controlling your life. That is resolved for God which means that your, your spouse shouldn't control you, your parents shouldn't control you, your neighbor shouldn't control you, your boss shouldn't control you. You need to be controlled by God. And there it is. If someone else has control, if someone else has control, they're manipulating you, you are committing the sin of adultery, not them, idolatry. Which means that you're making an idol, you're looking to that person to meet your needs, you're looking to that person to trust. So this is really important. So you've got to recognize it if you're being manipulated. Then you've got to have the difficult 100% truth, this is not going to work on me. And then you'll realize that the relationship is not really working so well anymore. And that's because up until now you've been compliant and you've been dancing the same dance with them, a bit of a ballroom dancing, you know. But then suddenly when you say this is no longer going to work, the relationship is going to get awkward because you're going to flip to a cha-cha while they're doing a waltz and this is just going to end up ugly and you're going to butt heads and it's going to be awkward. But you then have to redefine the relationship. You've got to redefine the relationship. Jesus allowed Peter to fail. Spectacular. G Peter had a massive problem of control and a, such a hothead and he was keep making all these mistakes and even at, towards the end here he shoots his mouth off and says, I'll never leave you Jesus, I'll never deny you and then he denies him three times and Jesus just lets it go on and then eventually Peter finally is broken and he realizes he's got to stop trying to control life, got to stop trying to control everything and he's broken, and then Jesus can restore him, and it happens on a beach over around a breakfast after Jesus' death, burial, and erection, resurrection. He said, Jesus said this, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, then take care of my sheep. Jesus then restores him back to a shepherding role. Paul never had a problem with this. If you look at Paul, it says, obviously, in Galatians chapter 1.10, Paul says, Obviously, I'm not trying to be a people pleaser. No, I'm trying to please God. If I were trying to please people, I would not be Christ's servant. Paul never had this problem, but Peter had this issue of control. He had this issue of manipulation, and he had to get to the end of himself. And then when that happened, 
Jesus restores him. So, if you've got someone that's manipulating you, it has to be addressed. It has to be addressed with full grace and full truth. You've got to ask, what does love require me in this situation? What does love require of me? You've got to follow Jesus' model of 100% grace and 100% truth. And I can tell you now, I know exactly what you're thinking. If I say to my friend, this is not going to work on me, they are going to yell, they are going to scream, they are going to chuck a nana, they are going to do all that. Yes, they are, because that is the second line of defense at the end before the final. And what they do is, you just, you just stand back, remain calm, and let them do their thing, let them chuck their nama and this, that, and they go, and then they're going to go, well, that was quite a tirade there. Hmm. But it still won't work on me. And then the next thing is they threat to leave. And that's, that's that game over at that point in time. But you have to have the conversation. Difficult is as difficult does. When you do difficult things, it's because difficult you is. But is you broken or is you evil? That's what's got to be figured out. You've got to figure that out. So I've given you a fair bit of information in here. What are you going to do about it now? Here's what I would suggest. If you're the manipulator repent. Stop it. Stop manipulating people, your family, your friends, your spouse, and start trusting God. Start trusting Him to lead you, Him to guide you. Accept the fact that you might be broken. Maybe there's something not quite right, and then say, you know what? I'm solid on my devotions, my soap, that's okay, but I probably need to go and do some EHS. I need to figure out what's going on in my life, and then make the decision to get some help. Even I'll get your host. Host will come, can put you in. Just say, listen, I want to get in the next EHS group. Just do something about it. Get some help. If you're the manipulated one, recognize it, as we've just talked. Have the courage and conviction to say, this won't work on me. Deal with the pain of it. Just deal with it. And then redefine the relationship. Redefine it. You might even sense that the person that's with you is, is broken. You get that sense, and if you get that sense, you know what? You might say, hey, listen, I'll come with you. We can go and do EHS together. It won't do me any harm to look back and see if maybe I'm operating out of some things that are wrong. Man, could you imagine what would happen if you went on that relationship together, the dynamic of your relationship? If you loved one another the way that Jesus has loved us, that's exactly what it is. You're loving one another the way he's loved us. That kind of love changes everything. That melts every human heart with the exception of one. And that's if you happen to be confronted by an evil person that, that the devil has placed there. They will not be moved by anything to do with that. Can you imagine what it'd be like if we as a whole church and the junction, if, if, if everyone lived like this, we ask, what does love require me of this situation? If we could tell the truth in love, model Jesus, 100% grace, but also 100% truth. If we could love one another the way he's loved us, wow, then they'd know that we are his disciples. Jesus said that's how they know. Friends, if we love like that, I'm telling you, you couldn't build a building anywhere big enough on the planet to house that because God would send people far and wide if they knew they could come they could experience the love of Christ they could find healing they can find health they can find a way home and get out of the situation they're in and back into God's original des design for a man I tell you what you couldn't stop it and these people are all around the rhythms and routines of the life that we have and they're just trying to figure out could, could I get back into a relationship with God Friends, there's difficult people everywhere because we are all difficult people if the right buttons are, to, uh, are pushed. Some of us are on our journey and we've been conformed to the image of Christ. Some of us are yet to start, but we're sure hoping that someone will extend us some grace and some love that when we're confronted with something that they'll love us back to health, help us deal with forgiveness, help us realize that life is forgiving, not just forgiving as in giving money, but forgiving, forgiving each other so another human being could actually say, you know what, I am broken. I, I know I do that, but I don't know why I do that. Well, let's do some exploration because I'll guarantee you, you learned that. You learned that in your family of origin, growing up with something that damaged you, something that wounded you, something that hurt you. So yes, there's evil people in the world. And you might get confronted by one, but most of us are broken. Most of us, our difficult is, is in the area of brokenness, and we've got to be 100% grace and 100% truth. 
So difficult is, as difficult does, and when you do difficult things, it's because difficult is who you is. The question is, is you broken or is you evil? If you're broken, extra grace required, help on the journey to be conformed to the image of Christ. If you're evil, that means a break of relationship. Difficult people, they're everywhere because we are everywhere. And we've got to have discernment to know how to handle them. Full of grace and full of truth, loving one another the way that Jesus has loved us. Let's pray together. Father, I just want to thank you for helping us to understand the fact that we're all broken to some extent and, and help us on our journey of being conformed to the image of Christ. Um, Lord, ones of us that are recognizing, even as I've been speaking, that they are being manipulated and they've recognized it, give them the courage and the conviction, which is one of our values, uh, to have that tough conversation to say, you know what, this is not going to work on me. And regardless of what happens and how badly they lose it, at the end to say, well, that's quite a tirade, but at the end of the day, this, it's not going to work on me. They have to be able to stand and then redefine the relationship. Help us to always ask the question, what does love require of us? And, and if someone right now, if you're realizing you are the manipulator, then you just have to repent. Repent means turn around and go the opposite direction. It means stop doing what you're doing. Stop trying to control everything. Surrender your life to Christ. That's why Jesus died for you, to set you free from having to control your own broken world that will eventually send you to a Christless eternity. Surrender to him and allow him to begin to take you back on the journey of being conformed to the image of Christ. And if you're the manipulated one, extra grace, extra grace everywhere. 100% truth, 100% grace. What does love require? And most people you're going to engage like this are going to be broken. Love them enough to walk with them and help them on their journey to get healthy and to get whole because that's what Jesus did for you and that's what he expects us to do for others. And if by per se you do happen to confront an evil person, then you need to respond the way we're instructed to. We love our enemies, we bless our enemies, we do good to our enemies. But then Paul goes on later and says, whatever you do in 1 Corinthians 5, don't eat with them, don't socialize with them, don't have them in your home, don't have them in their, don't go in their home because if they're down that track and they're really like that, you will compromise your own future. So it's not an easy topic dealing with difficult people, Lord, but it has to happen. Teach us to be wise. Teach us to be wise, Lord, and to be gentle. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.